I'm going to start with a few different questions to actually try to mix this up a little bit. Uh, I've been asking this of everybody. Uh, what TV series would you love to guest direct? Oh my God, that's so hard. Let me think. Oh, okay, my brain has to now engage. Um, what TV series? Well, you know what? I've become obsessed and I'm just getting to the very end of season five of a French show called The Bureau. Have you come across that? I've not seen it yet. Oh, it's great. If you like a spy show and it goes, they go all over the Middle East, Russia, and it, it's brilliantly done. You know, Mathieu Kasovitz who did, um, uh, what's that great French movie, the black and white, uh, uh, you'll know it like from 20 years ago. It's great. It's a great show. I, I, and I would love to, and I noticed that actually in the la, in this last season, I don't know if it's the very last, there's the one that's available. Um, uh, um, the director of A Prophet, Jack Audriard, directs, who's one of the great directors working in Europe at the moment, he, direct, he, he, he directs uh, a couple of the last episodes. And um, he, there's a, there's a seek into my movie. Um, he's the guy who discovered Tahar Rahim and put him in A Prophet. And uh, that's when I saw Tahar first in about 2008. And then I put him in his first English language movie, the Eagle with Channing Tatum in 2009. And we remained friends ever since. And when I thought about doing this movie, the very first person I thought of and got on the phone to was Tahar, sent him the script. He said, yes. And then we waited for two years to get the money. <laughs> I actually, uh, I you won't remember this. I actually spoke to you for the Eagle back okay. 10, 10 years ago. <laughs> and I, and I, listen, I love a prophet. And when I spoke to Tahar, guess who made him talk about the prophet? Ah, you're the only one of any sophistication in this Believe movie. Me. I mean, that that's a movie that, uh, you know, for anyway, I could spend the whole interview talking about a prophet, but that's not why we're here. No. Um, this is the, what's interesting is I think that that it films like this. First of all, congrats on this movie. You did such a great job with it. And it's one of these movies that I think everyone should see. Um, but I would you just mentioned it. It took a little while to get the financing. This is yeah. not a story that I would imagine people are like clamoring to go make. So talk a little bit about, even though with your track record uh, and the films you've delivered, that it must have been a struggle. It was, it was difficult to finance. Uh, I won't lie. Um, it's obviously a hard time for indie movies. It's hard for all movies right now. It's a hard time even before for indie movies. And, um, you know, luckily this uh, project attracted an amazing cast, you know, it's a kind of dream cast of people. And that's the reason we got to make it, but, but everyone made it for basically nothing. And we all did it because we thought it was an incredible story. And we particularly wanted to tell Mohamedou's story because that was what made me want to do it. I spoke to him right at the beginning of the process. I read the book. I was like, ah, I don't know. How do I make a movie out of this? I, another film about the war on terror. Then I spoke to him and he was so surprising. He wasn't, I expect him to be bitter, broken, angry. And he's the opposite of that. He's a man who's fully alive, who can talk seriously about what happened to him there, but without bitterness. And um, who's trying consciously to forgive. He's made this real decision. I don't want to be swallowed up by hatred and resentment and revenge. I want to move on from that. And it's a hard thing for him. It's every day he sort of says, you know, I have to... <laughs> you know, go, yeah, okay, don't think about that. Think it this way. And, but the other thing about him is that he's a, you know, huge pop culture fanatic. He could probably, you know, take you on at your own game. He, um, particularly in the period 2004 to 2015, when he's locked up in a cell in Guantanamo, and he's listening to all the music that his guards who are like 20 year old kids from Arkansas are listening to. Um, he's listening to, um, uh, you know, terrible country music well, I think it's terrible country music and he and he can sing all these all these terrible country songs he's watching every movie um falling in love with the big Lebowski watching 86 times um which is why of course we've got that song from Dylan at the end of the movie as a sort of homage to that um so he's just unexpected and a beautiful person and that's what made me want to do it I thought I want to tell the story of this man and in a way the humanizing of this character who, you know, would lump him in as, you know, he's a Muslim terrorist suspect, enough. Actually to take that story and to take that individual and humanize him fully so that hopefully the audience really care about him by the end of it, that was the goal. 
And that's why well, everyone else, that's why the other actors were attracted to it as well. They, they, they loved the idea of that. Yeah, well, mission accomplished. Um, one of the things that people might not realize or not, might not think about is the fact that Jodie Foster is very selective with the roles she is willing to do. And she has only made a few movies in the last 10 years. So yes. what was it like sort of courting her to be in this? Because landing her is a really big deal. Oh yeah, I mean, look, she's she's one of my old timers, you know. She's, I, I, you know, she is a legend, a veritable legend. I mean, she's been, you know, making classic movies when she's 11, 10 years old or whatever through till now. And we sent it to her pretty certain that she would say, no, we'd move on to, you know, second choice uh, because she doesn't do anything. And I, I phoned up her agent who, who, who was re a new agent for her. She had, she, her old agent she'd had since she was a kid and finally retired the new agent who I knew slightly, I phoned up and I said, I've got this thing for Jodie and so I have no idea what she's looking for. I don't know, you know, I, will she take it? I don't know, send it to her, send it to me. Send it off, three days later, Jodie um, emails and says, this is really interesting, let's talk. So I flew to LA, we sat down, we talked for hours and hours about all sorts of stuff. Um, and she told me that, she told me that her mom had recently passed away and her mom, uh, was a huge influence in her career. Her mom was her manager for most of her career. And um, she told me that her mom had briefly converted to Islam in the 70s and had taken her to, to the mosque a little bit. And so she was fascinated by the Islamic element of this as well. And that was one of the reasons. But I think more than anything else, she's looked at it and go, I know how to do this. And she, it was interesting because the process of working on the script, we worked together on her character quite a bit. And it was all about taking stuff out. I don't need this backstory. I don't need this dialogue. People are gonna know who I am. And this is about a professional woman who's given up everything in her life just to concentrate on her work. The discipline of that as an actor to sort of go, this is what I need. It was really remarkable to work with. And she was very, you know, she was she she was very good on, on scenes like the scene at the end with Mohamedou where um, uh, she goes to see him after she's read what he's been through. And there was a, there was a three or four line exchange between the two of them at the top of that scene, uh, which I thought was really beautiful. And she said, we were reading through it with Muhammad and she said, we don't need that. And I said, no, I'm not taking that out. I love that. No, don't need it. Take it out. And so I said, it was the only time we had a really argument. <laughs> and then of course I get to the cutting room. I've got this thing. I go, oh fuck, you don't need those lines, do you? And we took them out straight away, first thing. And she was totally right. So, you know, that just shows how she's so astute. Well, the other thing is Jody's a very talented director. And so what is it like working with an actor who's also a very talented director? And did you ever sort of get the feeling that maybe on one scene or whatever, she was so close to just saying something like, I would do it this way. Or <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? That of course was going in the back of my mind before we started. I thought, oh my God, you know, she's such a great director and uh, she's so experienced in front of the camera and behind the camera. but. I think, I don't know whether it's because she can compartmentalize her life or whether she's just very disciplined, but she was probably the single most responsive actor I've ever worked with. And this is that she, she did not say unnecessary things about, you know, maybe I could do this, well, yeah, I could wear a hat, you know. She was, you know, she was there to serve the story. And um, if you gave her a note, she would nod and execute it. And I was, you know, amazed. And I, and I think that, you know, she switched, she, she, I think she could just compartmentalize. I'm now an actor. I'm now here to serve the director and serve the script. And, you know, the other side of me, I'll talk about it tonight, but I'm not gonna talk about it now. So yeah, that was a real, that was a real pleasure. And uh, the funny thing is I worked, I, worked with, I worked with Ben Affleck on a movie a while ago, and he obviously is a great director. And it was very similar actually. You know, very, I had a similar kind of aspect of, um, you know, I'm actually quite glad to switch off the director side of me and I'm just now at your disposal. Do with me what you will. Sure, I also think that they know how much work, uh, uh, what it is to be a director and how much is going on and maybe they enjoy just shutting that true. off. I think that's also true, yeah. I think that's also true that they understand, that, you know, you've got to make your day, you've got 16 setups to do, you know, you cannot spend two hours. And I think, I think that is very true actually, that actors who have not directed um, 
sometimes can be completely oblivious to all of that and all the other things that you were, you know, you were thinking about, oh my God, that person's wig tomorrow is not going to be a problem. Will that old car start? And how are we going to do that shot if we don't have the crane? And all those things that are going around your head at any one time, uh, they're quite glad to let go of all of that. Obviously the stuff with Dahar, there's so much that he has to deliver in this performance and there's so much physically that he has to do. Um, can you sort of talk about what it was like on set directing him and trying, because you have the history with documentary films um, and all your documentaries, and I know you're always going for the realism of the moment, sort of talk mm. about, you know, uh, crafting these scenes. Well, with Tahar, um, it's such a complex character. It's such a, 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 a you know, he has to throw such a tiny little needle and he has to, he at one time both suspicious, threatening a little bit, potentially dangerous. You want to not really know who he is, but at the same time, you want to begin to be charmed by him and progressively more charmed by him and kind of fall in love with him by the end of the movie. Um, and so that's, a, you know, it's really hard to get to, to, to calibrate that. And so we would do a lot of different takes, just try a little bit more this way, try a little bit more that way. And he very quickly became obvious that he loved to just play with the scenes and explore. And, you know, we would have talked about it in advance, a little bit of rehearsal or whatever, but actually when we got on front of the camera, he would um, try it 10 different ways until he found, ah, there, there's a bit of this, a bit of that those ingredients, the spices that go into this scene. And, you know, that's a marvelous way to work because it's not, you know, when you're actually doing it rather than like dictating, no, this is how you say this line. This is, a, you know, when you actually, you, it's a collaboration between you and the actor where you're trying to take, you're discussing it, think that emotion there, the way you did that, you know, and then you, you can shape the whole piece like that in the moment. And I think Jody and Shailene, who are very different kind of actors, you know, they're, very much in the more in the Hollywood mold, you know, they, they, they come very prepared. They've thought about their intention in the scene in that moment, in that line, and they do it like that. They were really stunned by him, I think, and loved, you know, they, they said to me after the first day, God, that's like, you know, having your own private one man theater show. He's like doing all these different things in front of you. And they found it incredibly entertaining to watch him. And, um, so, so, and he's also, Alan Kukler, who's the, who's the DP on this, who's an old friend of mine. Um, he and I just loved shooting Dahar because he's very light aware. He knows where there's really interesting light. He'd always find the interesting shadow or the interesting highlight or whatever. I think subconsciously, I don't think he's thinking about that stuff, but he's very just, he thinks like a filmmaker rather than like a, so he's like a theater actor in one way, but he's a very film friendly actor in, in another way. So. You know, the first scene we shot with him, because Jody got really ill over the Christmas break that we had, and she couldn't come back. And and so we had to bring a lot of Tahar stuff forward to do other things, to you know, rearrange the schedule. And the very first day that Shahar Tahar had was his end speech that he has to give. At the end of the film, he's been through everything. And I was like, oh, this is a oh, disaster. And Tahar was like playing it very cool, playing it very cool, but I knew he must be this like, cursing me in the situation and he turned up and he stood looking into the lens at the end of the camera speaking right into the camera and he delivers this speech the first time so powerfully so movingly and Alvin and I look at each other and I'm like oh my god he, he is going to be brilliant and as we knew right from that very first take that he totally had, you know he immersed himself into this person so deeply and uh yeah from there on it, it you know it got better and better and he he, 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 the funny thing about it is he's, I've worked with actors who are, you know, very immersive before and kind of, you know, methody. And that can be really a nightmare for a director as well because they never switch off and, um, you know, they're totally humorless about everything. And they, but Tahar is like, you know, then he's like out chatting with everybody, hugging the makeup people, having a, one of his three packets of cigarettes a day, his 10th espresso, being charming in French. I mean, it's amazing, amazing. That, that, uh, that's fantastic. Um, uh, I have so many questions and I'm running out of time. So I'm trying to figure out what I want to actually bring up with you. Um, I guess I want to talk a little bit about the editing because 
this is something, as you mentioned, that you, you shot certain scenes a number of different ways. Talk a little bit about the challenge of, of crafting everything in the editing room. And also, I'm always obsessed with, like, if, if, if a director had a much longer cut uh, before uh, finalizing. Was, the yeah, there was a longer cut. And my editor, I got back from shooting in Mauritania in South Africa to my editor, Justine, who I've worked with for 23 years now. Um, and she was like pale. And I said, well, what, what's wrong with you? She said, well, the, you know, the, the, the assembly is three hours and 15 minutes. I don't know how we're going to get this down. And, uh, you know, I was like, well, it's better to be too long than too short, I suppose. And uh, we, we, you know, we had, we got it down to two and a half hours. And it was a really nice cut at two and a half hours, but it's obviously still too long. And from there, it was painful taking things out. And so, you know, the movie is still at just over two hours. Um, and, uh, you know, that was already, 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 already long. So yeah, there is a longer, there's a longer cut. I mean, I think what, what, what exists, what the challenge with the editing was that this is, you know, it's an incredibly complex structure, by far the most complex structure I've ever tried in a, in a film, because you've got three different time periods and you've got three different char main characters who you're following each individually at different times. So, you know, that's 3D chess right there. You know, it's really, really complex. And um, so a lot of our time was spent, you know, obviously nuancing individual scenes, but then a lot of the time was spent moving these bits around a little bit, you know, can you put that there? And, or we need, we feel like we need a little more of Jody or we need it, you know, this, that. And that's also why a lot of decisions were made when we were shooting it about different styles of shooting, different use of color um, and different aspect ratios. Um, in order to have a psychological effect, but also to differentiate between different periods so the audience, you know, hopefully they're not noticing those things consciously, but they're, they're not lost. They know oh, I'm here, I'm there, I'm in, in that time. And, and I think that's one of the things I, I think Justine did an incredible job because I haven't heard anybody, you know, many criticisms, but I've never heard anyone say, oh, I was confused, which is amazing. Can you consider all of that, all of that material? Believe me, I, I, I could talk a whole bunch about the aspect ratio changes, but I, I am curious because this this story has so much in it. Um, normally, uh, I'm like, okay, I don't need to see the, the deleted scenes or whatever, but is the cut that you had at two and a half hours something that's like finished, where at some point you might release an extended cut? Or is well, it sort of you know how it goes these days. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, if this movie makes any money, which is hard when the theaters are closed, um, then they might spend a little more money on, the, on that back end. And I would love to do that because I think it is, I think it is interesting. And because it's not a movie with a ton of special effects, because uh, it's mostly in camera, um, it's not that expensive to do a, you know, a, a, a cheap kind of video finish on something. So yeah, we, 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 I would love, I would love to do that. And I think, um, you know, because it is, is it, because so many characters are in this, um, I think in some ways it can benefit from, it can benefit from that because you get a little more time with everybody. There's so much to this story. And I, I do think that you guys did an amazing job with the edit, keeping everything going because it's over different periods. And I think the aspect ratio has really helped and the, the different, you know, color and filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, 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 I agree. Um, on that note, I'm going to stop and just say congrats. And uh, we did not talk about iguanas, but next time. Oh yeah, I love the iguana scene. One of my favorite scenes. Okay, that, that really nice. To, really nice to chat. And um, um, thanks for asking interesting questions for the end of my day.